Peter in trying to discern what ultimate reality is. One of the areas that I've been fascinated with that you and other philosophers have used is the concept of possible worlds to explore what our deepest understanding of reality is. What are possible worlds? How do they work? When we talk about possibility and necessity in everyday life, there are really two different kinds of idioms or phrases that we use. That is, we can just say that something is possible or necessary, or it's possible that that will happen, or it's necessary that that will happen. But we can also talk about possible outcomes, possible states of affairs, uh, ways things could have happened. Um, uh, we could say, that's the worst thing uh, that could have happened, or out of all the possible things that could have happened, that's the very worst. Uh, or we could say, it couldn't have been worse than that. In one we use, it couldn't have been. Uh, and we don't, we're not talking about any particular objects. Uh, but then on the other, we appeal to uh, some object, ways things uh, could have happened, possibilities, possible states of affairs. To talk about possible worlds is simply to refine that one of the two idioms. A possible world is a way things could have been. It's just a very comprehensive one, it's a way things could have been that's so detailed that it settles everything. And a maximal possible world. Yeah, if you like. That's certainly a phrase that philosophers use. It's a, uh, um, that just means that it settles everything. It doesn't leave anything open. Um, and this is pretty much something we all understand. Nobody um, says that they don't understand Leibniz's claim that this is the best of all possible worlds. <laughs> Maybe they don't understand how he could have believed it, but uh, in saying that, they bear witness to the fact they understand perfectly well what this fantastic thing uh, that he's saying is. You know, here's one plan for the world. Here's another plan for the world. Um, a possible world is just a big, complete plan uh, for the way uh, a world might be, a blueprint, possible blueprint for a world, something God could contemplate before relation, except that we have to remember when we think about God, as Leibniz did in this context, that if he exists, he's part of the blueprint too. It, mm. it isn't something, it isn't that God, for Leibniz, God stood outside all possible worlds and picked one. Yeah. They were really possible creations, mm. in other words. Whereas a possible world in the modern sense, in the 21st century sense, includes everything, including God, if there be a God. Why talk about these things? Well, I mean, the answer is, uh, that when you're thinking about possibility and necessity, when you're reasoning about possibility and necessity, it's very easy to go wrong. Uh, and it turns out the, reason, the rules for reasoning uh, using possibly and necessarily are difficult. Um, but it turns out that if you simply appeal to these objects, possible worlds, or ways things could be, or possible states of, uh, possible complete ways for the world to be, uh, that it's much more difficult uh, to make mistakes in reasoning. I don't know that they actually give us any deep enlightenment about modality, but they're a very useful tool, and philosophers use them a lot. Now, modality means? Possibility, possibility. and necessity. Mm -hmm. And so to explore that gives us a deeper insight into the way the world, the actual world we have, or maybe God's ideas, if you believe in God? Mm. Well, one thing to know, of course, is the way things are. But of course, another thing that people would like to know is whether this is the only way things could be. What are the alternatives? Are there alternatives? Um, one explanation for things being this way is that this is the only possible way for them to be. If you think that this isn't the only possible way for them to be, that immediately raises the question, <laughs> since the other ways are possible, why aren't things one of the other uh, possible ways? So in philosophy, and particularly in metaphysics, possibility and necessity are important topics. A vast number of, well, if you just look at the arguments, whether they're any good or not, that have bulked large in the history of metaphysics, uh, you'll see that possibility and necessity figure uh, in these arguments. Descartes argued that the mind, the metal, was not identical 
uh, with the physical, or rather that I must not be identical with any physical thing. I can't be identical with this body, for example, because I can imagine things, be, it's possible for things to be just as they are and this thing not exist, but it's not possible for things to be just as they are and I not exist. Otherwise, I mean, what I'm aware of when I'm aware of things being just as they are is my own existence. I'm not, um, my body's existence is not part of that uh, necessity. Uh, so my body might not have existed, um, and yet things be just as they seem to me to be, so I'm not my body. So, so possible worlds then is, is a vehicle to, 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 to make understand certain arguments, arguments like yeah, that. Right. The arguments become um, uh, much more, uh, that argument I gave was just a, a sample of the modal uh, argument, uh, but there are many, many arguments that employ possibility and necessity just in the way that one did in the history of philosophy, the ontological argument for the existence of God, the cosmological uh, argument uh, for the existence of uh, God, arguments about um, the beginning of the world in time, all sorts of arguments depend on modal considerations. And the arguments all become much clearer if we think in terms of possible worlds. Now, in looking at possible worlds, these certainly seem like sort of abstract ideas, uh, but uh, uh, David Lewis, for one, uh, ha has come up with a rather remarkable idea. How, how does yeah. that work? David Lewis began by talking about possible worlds the way I just did, as ways things could be. And everybody nodded, and he made some important, this was in his book, Counterfactual Conditionals, that is, conditionals of the form of so-and-so were the case, such-and-such such would be the case. One of the great advantages of possible worlds is that they've made uh, very important contributions to clearing up problems about counterfactual conditionals, by the way. Um, but it suddenly became clear in that book that he was actually thinking of possible worlds as more like the alternative realities or parallel histories of science fiction stories. Like those in there being real places you know, with real things going on in them, except differing from them only in that you can't go there. It's not possible <laughs> uh, to get in something else and visit, but they're there. Uh, they're things, they're, the other possible worlds are things just like our universe, uh, but not related to us in space and time. But internally, well, not just like us, you know, with minor variations uh, or maybe major variations, in fact, with all possible uh, variations. And people, had a hard time believing that that's what David meant. And, but, you know, if he disagreed with David Lewis, you know, the problem that you would have was that you knew that he was smarter <laughs> than you. So this philosopher, who was smarter than almost, I suppose Saul Kripke wouldn't have agreed with that, but <laughs> almost every uh, philosopher would have agreed that David was smarter than he, and yet he holds this absurd view. And everybody did think it was absurd. Uh, Lewis was forced when talking about the reactions to his, um, this view of his, uh, saying an incredulous stare is not an argument. <laughs> and that's what he got, incredulous yeah. stares. Um, I can say that uh, most philosophers who use the term possible world no, mean them to be abstract objects. Not, and David Lewis is almost alone, though not entirely alone, in meaning them to be um, uh, concrete objects. Well, since the time that he formulated that, there are now some physicists who are, if not going all the way to David Lewis in terms of all possible mm -hmm. logical possibilities, are certainly creating many kinds of uh, multiple universes, uh, universes based on mathematical forms, a whole mm -hmm. series of things that are developing. From David's point of view, <clears throat> those are just different parts <laughs> uh, of the actual world. They're just, they're just remotely, because they are in some way or other connected to us either in space and time or in space time uh, or by some space-like and uh, time-like relations. Um, mm. His other, if those physicists are right, the shape of the actual world is just much more complicated than we thought. Uh. Well, that's all. So, rightly or wrongly, David uh, would dissociate his theory of possible worlds, which is a purely philosophical theory involved with modality, 
uh, from these physical theories uh, which attempt to explain reality. I mean, actual reality. They are parts of actual reality. So, in terms of helping us understand actual reality, uh, how beneficial has possible worlds been? Well, as I say, I don't think there's anything that you can do. I mean, I'm talking now from my own point of view as a uh, believer, uh, uh, as someone who thinks of possible worlds as abstract objects. Now, I'll leave, I'll leave it to yeah. um, uh, the followers of David Lewis uh, to def- defend his view. And that is nothing I say applies to that. And can't, it doesn't suggest what those people <laughs> would say. But in my view, there's nothing you can do with them that you can't do without them. It's just that you can do things much easier with them and with much less chance of logical error. Because I'm a, I'm a realist about the thing. I think there are such uh, things. I wouldn't know how, to, how interesting they are in themselves. I mean, there are all sorts of abstract objects, and I don't know if they're more interesting than uh, any others, but they are certainly very useful. <laughs>